risk of switching over to a Mac laptop, so I hope you won't have a Mac moment, but bear with me and cross your fingers. Good, we're set. Um, well, thank you very much for the opportunity to um, talk through the, the thinking of this working group that has designed what is really the current, and I think it'll be the first, um, large-scale genetic analysis for, for UK Biobank. The thinking that, that, that drove our ultimate decisions is very similar to the thinking that you've heard in the other disease areas. From the outset, it was pretty clear that we needed data that would be genome-wide. The beauty of Biobank is you can use it to address any chronic disease. There was no point in um, any prior hypotheses. It wasn't a given at the outset that we would end up with an array-based SNP, that's a single nucleotide polymorphism genotyping experiment. There were quite extensive discussions about whether we should be really bold and consider DNA sequencing. If you sequence it at low pass, you get somewhat similar data. But the thing that, that, that won out when we all sort of calmed down and thought about it coolly was that array-based genotyping um, is now very robust, very established. And this is what has given us genome-wide association studies and really blown the field wide open for, for common disease genetics. It's robust in terms of data generation, generating the genotypes of these individual polymorphisms in quality control, and um, a lot has been learned about how to analyze the data. And Peter Donnelly, in particular, who led the Wellcome Trust Case Control Consortium, um, and colleagues have worked out um, a key entity that you may know of called imputation, whereby you can infer missing genotypes because genotypes are inherited in blocks. And so we knew that we would be working with something um, that would give reliable data. We were confident it would be scalable, but it's important to say that when we started thinking about typing everybody, this was a huge project. We take it for granted now, but it was almost unimaginable a year or two ago. Um, and it's really quite affordable. So the, the array that I will come to um, actually came in at about £32 for the array and the genotyping per person, an astonishingly low sum compared to what it would have been a few years ago. Genotyping SNPs is without doubt good for common variants, which I think we all believe are the main cause of susceptibility to common diseases. It's not the optimal strategy for low frequency and rare variants, and I think before long there will be a groundswell of opinion that we need to sequence the whole of UK Biobank. But this is for here and now and for the next, I don't know, maybe five years, these will be the data that we will all have to work with. The beauty of going for something genome-wide and affordable, I in a way, was that it was possible to get everybody in, in the frame of mind of thinking of doing one definitive study. And the reasons for that um, are below, and I think they're clear, and they, they mirror points that have already been said. You do need a very large number of samples to get genetic power in common disease, particularly if you're looking at a disease endpoint. So, for example, in coronary disease, there are already um, international consortia that have data on maybe 50 or 60,000 cases. So if you're doing a prospective study, you need something like half a million denominator to get large numbers of cases. Just as with all the other assays, genotyping is susceptible to batch effects using different platforms, different processes. And if you want to compare different groups, which of course is the ultimate experiment, the uniformity of doing it all in one go is very attractive. The economies of scale are astonishing here. This was a bespoke new array. I'll explain it more in subsequent slides. Um, and the fact that the order was coming in for half a million arrays drove the price down below anything that you might have expected. And then we've touched on this business here. If you had not done an overarching experiment, there will be different groups that would want to do a DNA analysis on 10,000 cases of this or 5,000 cases of that, 20,000 controls. You'd have partially overlapping groups, and you'd have a very inefficient and extravagant and wasteful study. And in fact, it was because the, um, the respiratory, the COPD by leave study, that it got off the blocks first, it already generated funding for 50,000, that it focused everyone's minds in saying, OK, we don't want to do this piecemeal. Really, we should do it blanket. Um, I think Rory was very modest in his account of how the funding was put together. I, I think he 
Um, and certainly Peter Donnelly and others on a group had a very clear role in getting everybody thinking the same way, getting the funders lined up, um, coordinating different bids. You've, you've heard about the, the by leave one, you'll hear the detail later. Um, Paul Elliott um, headed a cardiometabolic bid to the British Heart Foundation, and in really quite a short space, moved the agenda on to doing one definitive study. The um, UK by Lee study, and you'll get the details from Martin Tobin, um, and the design of that and the design of the biobank um, sort of coalesced, but it was clear that this was going to kick off first, and the main biobank genetic analyses follow hot on the heels. Tenders went out, and I think it's testament to the power of the study, like UK Biobank, that it's incredibly effective at getting newly created bespoke solutions. Um, the industrial providers will really work hard for something of this scale, um, and very, very competitive tenders came in from um, different providers, and the one that was selected, and obviously, unsurprisingly, was the same for both, was an Affymetrics platform, which I might not have anticipated, but they made a, a truly impressive effort, which I will outline a bit. Um, the working group was convened to, to try to consider what were the types of genetic data that you would like to have if you were doing a large-scale genotyping experiment. And this, I think, also is testament to the power of Biobank to bring together a group with a lot of different disciplines to get everybody um, coherent and cohesive and thinking in the same direction. Um, Peter convened and chaired it and brought the expertise that he developed in the Welcome to Us Case Control Consortium. We had very, very sophisticated genetic analytical expertise from the likes of um, perhaps particularly Richard Durbin, Gil McBain. We had a lot of real-world large data ex expertise from people like Mark McCarthy. And it was a real pleasure working with this group. We had weekly teleconferences and really quite quickly um, coalesced on how to get the best out of the opportunity that presented us. So what the expert group had to do was to come up with the types of genetic data, common variants, rare variants, um, structural variants, that you would ideally have, and then try to figure out how to get them all in one affordable array. The amount of territory of space in an array is finite, um, and the, I think the sophisticated analysis that the academics did was trying to trade off the priorities to come up with an array that as many people as possible would ultimately be happy with. But largely, uh, and this comes to the sort of analysis that, or the process that, that Tim um, Peatman spoke about, I think the job with academics was to design and commission and explain the sort of space we wanted to work in. The industrial process was then handed over to Affymetrics, and one of the reasons that they won the tender was it was very clear they had very profoundly excellent bioinformatics support, um, and they were able to look at their um, 9 million SNP panel that they had validated that they knew worked, and to use them to help us meet our various targets, address the different categories of genetic variant, um, to do it in a way that would facilitate imputation, which would be hugely important going forward, and in a way that would have a high success rate. And I think the whole process worked well. The most important bit of my talk for you this morning is going to be about what's actually on the array. You don't need to remember everything I say. You don't need to write it all down, because it's very beautifully laid out on the web, on the Biobank web pages. You don't even need to write down this URL. If you just put in UK Biobank, genetic array, you'll find it by Google. I checked that this morning. And there are some very nice data sheets there. They, <clears throat> excuse me, they describe the content summary, and I'm going to spend a few minutes now just talking through the categories and why we think they're useful, just to key you in. But when you want details, go to the website. There are instructions as to what to do when you want to ask, is my favorite genetic variant on the array, or is there a proxy that would work for it? Um, at the moment, that's not a direct search, but I think that will come in time. For now, you have to send in an inquiry. There's information about the non-disclosure agreement that you would need. This is still, um, in part, commercially sensitive. And it might surprise you, but there is an opportunity to order more. You might think half a million is all you might want, but there are actually some very good reasons why you might want more. You might want to genotype your particular study. You might have a selection of cases. Biobank will provide fantastic controls. The price is extremely good, and the array is very well designed. Equally, you might want to modify and have a bespoke new order for a different ethnic group, and I'll touch on the detail of that later. So this, I think, <clears throat> is the key slide, which I will talk through the different components of genetic information that the array will provide. 
I start at the top, I think the core experiment is a, a grid of um, SNPs that are designed to optimize the type of imputation experiment you want to do a genome-wide association study. This is based on um, markers of relatively high frequency that were selected because of high frequency in the Europeans. This is relatively standard. What's more sophisticated is that there's a very large number. This is 275,000 variants that are low frequency but are within the um, 1 to 5 percent range in Europeans. And the addition of this will allow this array um, and the subsequent imputation to get down to quite low frequency variants. And that's part of the genetic space that's really not very well searched at present. Going still progressively um, rarer, we then looked at what is known to some of you as the exome array. So this is an existing commercial array, there are a couple of them, that look at all the variations that directly affect the structure of genes. These are coding variants. They are more likely to contribute to disease. We want to enrich the array. But the commercial arrays at the moment have very many variants that are just not polymorphic or hardly polymorphic at all. So to make space, we just took the 80,000 best ones, the most frequent ones. We've added in 33,000. These are the MacArthur loss of function variants that people in the field will know that, again, are likely to, to damage a protein product, more likely to associate with disease. The one sort of rare disease um, experiment that we've done is to put on pathogenic or, or variants that have been thought to cause rare Mendelian disease in the literature and the existing databases. And I'll just highlight that, and this is another table that you can find on the web, so I'm just illustrating a couple of details. Right down here, you might wonder why we would put rare variants on. Well, it turns out to be highly important. At the moment, if you go on the human genome mutation database, you will find large numbers of variants that are thought to cause Mendelian disease. We know how predictive they are of that disease in the setting where someone's got a phenotype and perhaps a family history. We can't interpret them when you find them by chance in the population. But once we start doing population type genome sequencing, we will find these variants and we need to know how to interpret them. And there's a particular need for inherited cancer and inherited cardiac disease, particularly sudden cardiac death conditions, because these are the disorders that some um, opinions in the field feel are serious. If you have them, you really need to know, your relatives need to know, and actionable there is something you can do if you've got a BRCA2 mutation. But at the moment, we don't know how to interpret these variants, and to get their frequency, just on the population will be very valuable, and to get ultimate associations with disease, really important. Moving around the rest of the array, there's now a large number of categories of common variants that are here, not because they're good for imputation, but because they've got some existing claim to associate with something that you will care about. So we have a large number of variants that are known to associate with a level of expression of the neighboring gene. This comes from Juvadis, a number of different tissues. Some people in the field will, will know the details. These are very likely to have functional effects in the genome. Um, there's an interesting project here to take 20,000 variants that are likely to have come into our genome from the Neanderthal genome. They're not in modern African genomes. And there are views that say that they're particularly enriched for susceptibility to disease. In the category miscellaneous, there's some really important things here. Very dense typing over the HLA region. This is, of course, where genetic association started. So people like Adrian will be pleased to see 8,000 markers here. Thank <laughs> you.